let's try to do this synthesis. Let's come up with some reagents that would take us from here to here. Let's try to use all the kinds of uh, labeling and numbering that we've been using on the previous problems. And this is really going to follow the same pattern. We're going to follow this pattern here for this problem. really good. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, well, at first it seemed like you were stuck, but actually you, you worked it out. That's good. You used a lot of the strategies we've been talking about. What's this symbol here? Uh, Right, by a weird coincidence, it looks like a two, two as well. Okay. <laughs> that, that caught me too. All right, so we can label this both as the number two and as our alpha carbon. Now, one thing that you did very well here is that you realized that this is not the number three carbon. I think that would mess a lot of people up. If you label this the number three, this is not the number three, because remember, this is going to get blasted off eventually. Remember, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to make a alpha-substituted carboxylic acid. That's one way to think about it, anyway. We can think of this whole bit, we can think of this whole thing as a substituent on this alpha carbon. We're trying to add this substituent to the alpha carbon, and we know this is a good way to do that. Well, in our melonic ester synthesis, this is going to get blasted off, so it's good that you saw that those should get different numbers. So this is the key bond that we have to make. So that is the key squiggle that we have to put in. So the first thing you had to do, then, was make this into an enolate. Um, now, only one technical issue here, you used sodium hydroxide. But remember, we want to use a base that matches your leaving group so that we don't need to worry about nucleophilic competition. I guess on a multiple choice test, you'll be able to use whatever base they, they gave you. But anyway, we've got here so we can add our C 
sodium ethoxide. Now we know that the sodium ethoxide is going to make this into an enolate. Mm -hmm. And then the hard part is then to figure out how to deliver this fragment here. Well, the numbers really help. We've got the 4, 5, and 6. And the key thing is we have to attach somebody else to the number 4. In the product, the number 4 will be attached to the number 2, but it's not attached to the number 2 yet. Well, we can attach it to whoever we want. Right. Who did you attach it to? That's a good leading group. Sure. What type of mechanism then is going to be the reaction then between the enolate and this? An SO2. Very good. And once again, notice that this functional group over here on the right is basically just a distraction. Okay. This is just a distraction. And it did. It did. It, I got caught up a little bit thinking about right. how, what would I add that could potentially interfere with that or whatever. Right. Yeah. Ethers are not too reactive. We don't need to worry about this doing an SN2 because this is not a good leaving group. Okay. So we don't need to worry about the enolate attacking the number six because this doesn't have a good leaving group. So this is basically here just to distract us. We might as well just, since we can add any um, react reagent we want, we might as well add, add a reagent that's already got the methoxide group on it so we don't have to add that separately. So if you were doing this on the test, the safest thing would be to draw each intermediate. So here we've accomplished what we wanted. Notice how I've rotated this down out of the way to show that it's going to be getting, we're getting, going to get rid of it. So now we've formed the bond that we were trying to form all along. And the last thing we have to do is hydrolyze this and um, get rid of it. So we could do it in one step with uh, aqueous acid and heat. But as usual, your instructor uh, did that in a couple of steps. So they did sodium hydroxide and water. And they did hydrochloric and water. And then they did heat. So the sodium hydroxide turns both of these groups into carboxylates. Then the, uh, the acid turns them both into carboxylic acids. And then how do we know that these are good candidates for decarboxylation? Because they're beta carbonyl carboxylic acids. But we only, we're only going, to lose, only going to lose one of them. It doesn't matter which one you take off because they're symmetrical to each other. But we might as well take this one so it looks more like our product. We don't need to worry about this decarboxylating because it's not a beta carbonyl anymore. And we got it. Well, like I said, it looked, at the start it looked like you were stuck there, but you really worked out the whole thing. That's very good. The only technicality you missed was the base here. So that's good. All right, so when do we use these? So here we have both of these up on the board. When we're trying to form a ketone with carbon substituents on the alpha carbon, it's a good idea to start with the 1,3-dicarbonyl with the ketone and ester. Okay. And if you're trying to form a carboxylic acid with carbon substituents on the alpha carbon, you want to start with a 1,3-dicarbonyl that's a diester. Then we can use this RH. pretty similar, so we can use the same types of techniques and the same types of numbers and labeling. 